I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to um, speak to a comment that came through from, uh, and I'll use the person's name because they did, from M at uh, 31 minutes past the hour. And it relates to other comments from people about difficulties with attending to the breath. So um, as M wrote, some might find sitting more upright with dignity to be very prejudicial to those not blessed with that physical ability. Beingness does not depend on physical ability or bodily position. So I've been reflecting on M's comment there, and it's very relevant to really any kind of practice and to many different kinds of important diversity. Uh, traditional suggestions, such as the Zen suggestion to sit in a way that is um, soft in the front and firm in the back, or a typical suggestion that makes sense, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, to uh, sit with a soft smile, or a little almost smile, or to sit in a position that has a kind of dignity with it, or to pay attention to the breath, or any one of a number of other classic suggestions that are helpful for many, many people, and yet for some are um, exclude them, exclude them. Even if that's not the intention, the suggestion in excludes people who can't participate with it. Uh, different kinds of neurological diversity, such as uh, you know fairly high levels of just natural distractibility and stimulation seeking. Many traditional suggestions exclude that kind of person. Uh, different kinds of uh, neurodivergences of different kinds. Uh, you know, classic instructions can be exclusive. And if you have the privilege, as I do, of uh, not being excluded, mainly due to the luck of the draw, genetic lottery, uh, and also just uh, being fortunate in this life and lucky in various ways, uh, you know, you, it's easy as a teacher or as a participant to not realize that many well-intended, um, suggestions around practice leave a lot of people out. And if, and if you're a person who's been left out or pushed out prejudicially with, with bias and discrimination, that um, even if it's inadvertent, uh, unintended uh, exclusion can be very wounding, especially in a setting where it's the last thing you expect and you really want to be included. So I want to really just acknowledge that and name it. Um, when giving in, you know, suggestions that do apply to many people, it's pragmatically difficult to just kind of keep dropping in mentions of this may not fit for you, and if it doesn't, just let it go. And and when when one should do that as much as one can, but even that is going to still just sometimes leave people out. So I guess I want to name that, you know, and I want to name the poignance of that and um, the reality of that and the opportunity uh, that is present to not leave out in our own consciousness that we are leaving others out and sometimes pushing them out, uh, particularly if we occupy any kind of position of um, privilege or advantage. Um, in our society. We can include that we're not including everyone in our awareness and we can keep it, keep it in mind and, and do the best we can and keep doing better <laughs> with that respect, really, and invitation and welcoming for all beings, very consistent with the Buddha's invitation, which was absolutely radical and politically radical in his time, 
uh, without exception, all beings uh, t- invited into the heartwood of practice, uh, irrespective of their different, you know, positions in society, gender as a category, and and all the rest of that. So I I just want to name that and appreciate M for, you know, putting it out there and. Uh, you know, um, and to just say that if any suggestion I offer in practice or any teaching I offer in my, the talk, for example, I'm about to give doesn't speak to you, uh, as the Buddha, you know, famously said, see for yourself, see for yourself, let it go if it doesn't work for you and see if you can find other things that work for you. That's why in part, it's important to have guest teachers, uh, in this gathering here and, and for people to look for other, uh, sources of, uh, teaching, um, that, uh, you know, are diverse and, and, and speak to you. It's a really important thing um, in, our, in our journey of practice. Uh, yeah. So specifically, uh, you know, if um, a suggestion having to do with the embodiment of practice doesn't speak to you, phew, you can let it go. If, if you're not able to sit upright or, you know, assume a posture that for you at least has a quality of gravity and presence and dignity, pew, let that go. If you're not able to sustain attention to the breath, pew, let that go. If it's hard for you to sit still, pew, let that go. Find what works for you, really. Uh, if it's hard for you to practice or meditate for long periods of time in a row, pew, <laughs> one minute meditation, <laughs> one breath meditation, Half a breath, one inhalation or one exhalation or something else, um, you know, find what works for you. Uh, as they say in Tibet, uh, to my understanding is there's a proverb there. If you take care of the minutes, the years will take care of themselves. If you take care of the seconds, the minutes will take care of themselves. And that's uh, again and again where we can orient as to what are the seconds now and now and now, that will really work best for you. That's the most fundamental principle. So uh, I'd like to continue now uh, building on a theme that I began with last week, which has to do with the power of the single word already. What is already the case? And this word, which seems so, (laughs) I don't know, maybe bland or like whatever, uh, actually is a portal into very profound teachings pointed to by the Buddha 2,500 years ago, who basically pointed out that in the moment, in the present, uh, there's an enormous difference between being essentially already relatively free of craving and I'll tell you what I mean by that word and what he meant by that word in a second, already relatively free of craving or already relatively consumed by it. Uh, Craving is the common translation in English of tanha, the word in Pali, a key language of early Buddhism, whose etymological root is thirst. Craving is the second noble truth that gives rise to suffering when it meets the first noble truth of dukkha in Pali, the simple fact that all experiences are changing and um, there are sometimes unpleasant experiences in this life. And even the most pleasant experiences pass away. And all experiences have the nature of of emptiness. They're foamy and cloud-like rather than brick-like. So no single experience can be a lasting source of happiness. That's dukkha. Dukkha does not change with enlightenment. Dukkha is an inherent condition in life. Dukkha itself is not suffering. Unpleasant experiences are also impermanent. Thank you, Dukkha. It's when we get caught up in craving with an underlying sense, like with thirst, of something missing and something wrong. In the meeting of our fundamental needs for safety, Satisfaction and connection, broadly stated, it's when we bring craving to dukkha that suffering begins. The problem is that Mother Nature's plan for her little babies, including you and me, is that we crave. We get caught up in drivenness and contraction and pressure. 
uh, as a way to pass on genes that pass on genes. This well-intended plan creates a lot of suffering. So what can we do about it? And this question then becomes very central and right in front of us, huh, what causes craving? If craving, if craving causes suffering, craving broadly stated, not just the extreme craving of an addict to get the next fixed, but the subtle craving that other people like you or that uh, they buy your book, <laughs> hello, uh, or that uh, you, are, you maintain your position in the conversation or that you are included in a group or that other people think the way you do or vote the way you do. Uh, any kind of contracted, self-referential, pressured, pressured, stressed uh, positionality, typically accompanied with one negative emotion or another, that's craving. That's craving. So what causes that craving, which causes our suffering? The Buddha did not have access to biology as it's now understood and evolutionary psychology, but we do. And we can understand that craving is what animals do in order to survive and pass on genes that pass on genes. Craving is a response to the sense that needs are not met enough in the moment. When needs feel met enough in the moment, there's no basis for craving. We are already, there's that word, we are already full. We are, all, we are already in balance. In the core of our being, we are not hijacked by an invasive sense of deficit or disturbance, which triggers craving biologically as a drive state. We are not invaded in the moment by a sense of something missing and something wrong. So how in the world do we feel already enough, already complete, already uh, full? How do we do that in the face of life's challenges? Other people, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre's comment, hell is other people, right? How do we do it? How do we do it when there's physical pain? How do we do it in the face of illness? How do we, how do we find this um, liberation from the biological machinery of craving uh, while we're suffering grievous loss or outraged at the politics of our country or um, dealing with the long, long, long shadow of trauma in our own childhood. How do we do it? How do we do it? Well, there are two fundamental ways to reduce the machinery of craving. Two fundamental ways that are grounded in our biology, our neuropsychology, and science. Two fundamental ways. What are they, you might ask? Number one, strategy or way or path is to grow the psychological resources of various kinds inside ourselves, cap qualities, inner strengths, broadly stated, such as mindfulness or self-compassion, equanimity, insight, tranquility, um, positive emotions, happiness itself is skillful means, resilience, secure attachment, executive functions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to grow the inner strengths that enable us to meet challenges to needs reasonably effectively without letting understandable feelings of anxiety or frustration or hurt involving other people, let's say, without letting them invade the core of our being. So we build strengths, we build capabilities so that we can meet challenges with needs feeling already equipped to deal with them. Increasingly applied to bigger and bigger challenges. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's easy to feel equipped to deal with the minor challenge of, you know, lolling around in your hammock, sipping an umbrella drink, uh, and a fly, you know, lands on your umbrella you can feel already equipped to, you know, see you later, see you later, buddy. So long, fly. Right? That's pretty easy. But how do you feel already equipped uh, when um, a project you've been working on 
you know, doesn't really succeed? How do you feel already equipped when your partner uh, turns to you and says something a little critical or maybe a lot critical? How do you feel already equipped for that, right? Well, we need bigger and bigger, you know, more and more developed inner strengths of various kinds. So we do the practices that the Buddha laid out and other people have laid out for us in which we cultivate greater mindfulness, greater traits of compassion, traits of self-compassion, greater traits of self-worth. We cultivate a release and a healing of traumatic material or simply, as in my case, you know, a chronic sense of inadequacy and related feelings of un unhappiness and loneliness as a kid for various reasons, many of them having to do with my, my own actions. Um, you know, we build inner strengths. That's a major strategy. And you might ask yourself, to deal with the challenges in your own life these days, what inner strengths would really help you if they were more developed inside? If you had them with you increasingly wherever you go. So that's a major, major path, the cultivation, bhavana, in Pali, of various inner strengths. The Buddha laid out eight of them, uh, the, the strength of wise view, the strength of wise intention, the strengths of the various skills that enable wise speech, wise livelihood, wise action, strengths of wise effort, wise mindfulness, wise concentration. Uh, he laid out various factors of awakening, like the seven classic factors, uh, which overlap to some extent the Eightfold Path, strengths of um, investigation, mindfulness, effort, uh, tranquility, concentration, uh, bliss, and equanimity. Different strengths, different kinds. We cultivate these things. In ordinary terms, you know, we cultivate virtues like patience. I'm still working on that one. Um, you know, and, and we cultivate uh, positive moods over time because happiness itself is a major buffer against the stresses of life that land on us and tend to trigger us into craving. Okay, that's a broad path. And also, second, major strategy to gradually undo um, the machinery of craving is to repeatedly internalize the genuine felt sense of needs met enough in the moment, which then moves us into repeatedly internalizing the sense of things like peacefulness and calm strength, open-hearted strength, a sense of contentment, internalizing feelings of gratitude and gladness, internalizing the sense of feeling already connected, already of worth, already loved, already loving. So when we have these experiences of the fruits of practice and experiences that naturally come when we feel like our needs are met enough in the moment, we feel safe enough in the moment in the core of our being. We feel satisfied enough in the moment. We feel connected enough in the moment in terms of our three major need categories. Whew. Really let those experiences land. That's our second major strategy. Number one, growing specific strengths that let us manage challenges without tipping into the red zone of craving. Check. And second, as we have opportunities to feel already okay, whoo, turn on the inner recorder, take in the good to grow the good that lasts inside and really let that sink in. So this is a very broad framework that highlights a life of practice. Uh, and uh, it's one that's been very meaningful for me. It's a approach, these two major strategies that is full of common sense, very practical, very specific and very direct. So in that framework now, I'd like to talk about uh, and explore how to develop the sense of feeling already, already rested in calm strength, already determined, already capable to deal with challenges to your safety, already all right right now, basically, already fundamentally at peace in your innermost being, even as 
life comes at you in agitating, threatening, stressful ways. How do we do that? So I want to speak to some of the the major ways to do that, and that you can do. And some of these might already be present for you, and some of them you might think, "Uh aha, wow, that one would have a lot of value for me. I'm going to focus on that one these days. Okay? One of the major inner strengths that we can develop, which can help us manage anxiety and manage uh, threats that trigger us, is to cultivate a kind of resting state of calm inside your own body. Again, like all my suggestions, to the extent that's possible for you. This is not a calm that is numb or is a spiritual bypass. We develop these strengths and we gradually hardwire um, an unshakable core of resilient well-being. That's the second major strategy through repeated internalization of the sense of that. We develop that both for our own well-being and to improve our coping with the challenges of life and so that we have more that we can offer to others, including when the oatmeal hits the fan. So we engage practices first to develop a greater resting state of calm in the body and a more rapid recovery to that increasing resting state of calm strength in the body um, when we get agitated or rattled. We come home more quickly. So there are different ways to cultivate resting state calm. Repeatedly practicing progressive relaxation helps. Uh, Being more in tune with your own breath and the sense of what's called parasympathetic activation as we exhale at length, that really helps. Biofeedback devices of various kinds, like inner balance from the HeartMath Institute or others, things that are even freely available that help you become more aware of when you know the needle starts moving out of green towards chartreuse, yellow, orange, and red. So you become more aware of that and you become more familiar with what it's like to be more in yellow, if not chartreuse, and hopefully even deep green. That's very effective as well. So the cultivation of calm. We really can do it. A lot of research shows that people can develop what Herbert Benson's many years ago described as the relaxation response. Okay. A second thing we can do is to make sure that we're that the we're not being excessively alarmist in our own mind, that we're overestimating threats. You know, in um, Back in Jurassic Park, uh, and certainly in the Stone Age, you could make two kinds of mistakes. One mistake is to think that something's about to get you when there's actually no threat there. The other is to think that everything's fine, but in fact, a tiger tiger is about to pounce. The risk and cost of the first mistake is needless anxiety. The cost of the second mistake is no mistakes forever. So we're designed to make the first mistake thousands of times to avoid making the second mistake even once. That's what I call paper tiger paranoia. It's a great way to keep people on their toes. It's a lousy way to have quality of life. So make sure you're not overestimating threats. We can get very obsessed and ruminate about threats that are very unlikely, or if they did occur, would not have life-threatening consequences or you know, really would not have really adverse, big, big consequences. And even if they did occur, and even if they did have big consequences, there are lots of ways to cope with them. And ultimately, we can develop a kind of perspective that realizes that, as Suzuki Roshi put it a while ago, uh, bless his memory, living is like setting sail in a boat that you know will sink. And finding ways to be at peace with ultimate consequences as a kind of frame of reference. So that's the second major suggestion for dealing with anxiety or anger or helplessness related to challenges to our need for safety. So you might ask yourself, huh, am I overestimating threats? Am I ruminating about things after I've done what I can and there's nothing else that I can do? Um, can Can I become more tolerant of the fact that I'm helpless about many, many things. 
and find ways to have perspective that enabled me to be at peace with uh, many, many um, inescapable forms of helplessness, including helplessness, you know, about many of the processes in our own body and how they unfold, helplessness about how other people are. Can we come to peace with that? So that's a second major suggestion that has to do kind of with how we think and our belief systems. And there's tons of research that supports what I'm saying here. A third thing I want to speak to is um, to recognize that our body may still be rattled, our mind may still be rattled by traumatic history. Or to recognize that our, we might have physiological disturbance from the inside out. We might have an illness or just an underlying inflammatory condition in the body, either of which traumatic history, residues of life experiences, or simply pure physiological bodily processes, either of which is sending alarm signals up into the brain that arise into consciousness and understandably, ah, make us feel threatened. When in fact, that seeming signal of alarm, that apparent signal of alarm from the residues of our history and from the past, that seeming signal of alarm from our psychological history or from our current biology and physiology is not a signal, but it's just noise. It's not meaningful. It doesn't add any information value. It doesn't mean that there's something bad actually about to happen. It's like a car alarm going off that doesn't mean anything. Does somebody bumped a car or whatever, it went off. Um, it's just noise. And it's really useful to be able to label uneasiness, apprehensiveness, anxiety. That's like a trait, you know, that's on kind of autopilot or bubbling up from your immune system entwined with your nervous system. It's really useful to be able to label that as what it is. It's unpleasant. We wish it weren't there. If it's there in another person, out of compassion for them, we wish it weren't there, we're not there for them. And yet here it is. But we can recognize that it's not meaningful. We don't have to be agitated by it. We can take a page out of the book of the Buddha, as he said, as best we know, in his own run up to awakening, Yes, painful, racking feelings arose, but they did not invade my mind and remain. This third suggestion around feeling threatened is really useful if it's relevant for you. Okay. The car alarm is still blap, blap, blapping away. Ugh. The body is still in pain or discomfort but we don't have to get alarmed about it or triggered into panic or reactivity through recognizing it for what it actually is. One specific example of this is what we could call, might call primal, primal separation, even going back to birth, in which in early, early life as an infant, it's quite possible to have experienced a kind of primal wound or primal um, catastrophe at birth or soon after. And there can be a sense deep in the body of that way down deep. That's kind of the tip of the root that anchors our anxiety. What do we do about it? Um, we can be aware of it. We can kind of soften and 
in the factor of awakening, one of the seven factors is investigation. We can sense down, we can feel down into, we can kind of intuit down into the deepest roots of our psyche, making sure that we can tolerate and bear what we find there and direct a kind of soothing, a kind of tenderness. It, it feels very intimate all the way down, Ooh, all the way down into whatever is real for you. And it, this may not be real for you. It feels real for me, certainly in some ways. Ooh. And to help there be a kind of an easing way down deep to that very primal source of false alarm signals today. There was something that happened way back when. Birth itself is a profound separation, kind of a shocking transition. Uh, sometimes for some more shocking than for others, depending on circumstances and the sensitivity, such as being born prematurely. Uh, the sensitivity, understandably, of the organism, the person. Uh, but today, that tip of the root way down there as a kind of primal anxiety is a false alarm. It's like the false alarm of the emotional residues of our history today, or the false alarm of inflammatory processes in the body. Uh, and we can gradually soothe that very specific kind of false alarm with practice over time. Then I want to name um, a fourth major well-researched factor of helping yourself feel already, already basically okay in the present. And that's the sense of feeling connected to others. I'll, Later on, uh, I'll speak to that particular need, you know, two talks from now. We're focusing now on safety, particularly um, with a, associated emotions of fear, anger, and a sense of helplessness. Uh, you know, being warm-hearted yourself, you'll just notice calms anxiety. Uh, the amygdala, the alarm bell of the brain, has receptors for oxytocin on it that have an inhibitory effect as that neurochemical uh, activity increases with the felt sense of lovingness and warm-heartedness and open-heartedness, uh, giving and receiving with others. You know, turning toward that in this, you know, fourth suggestion, um, the, the sense of connection can really be calming and help you realize, okay, in this moment at least, I'm not about to die. In this moment at least, I'm basically all right right now. So then, when, through, let's say, practicing with and cultivating over time the strengths, the four strengths I've named so far of, of calming and clear seeing, not overestimating threats, not being swayed by paper tiger paranoia, and third, um, addressing, you know, the false alarms that bubble up into consciousness that then we think are meaningful, and fourth, turning into the a felt sense of positive relatedness, uh, given and received. There are other strengths as well, but for me, those four are really big. Uh, and they're all, you know, they all have a kind of an embodied sense to them that's really useful. When you're having those kind of experiences and, and when those strengths in you are gradually developed increasingly as traits that color your consciousness increasingly over time. When that's happening and you have the opportunity to feel in the present basically all right right now. You have, a, you have an opportunity in the present to feel sufficiently equipped to deal with the scale of challenges that you're facing. When you have that opportunity to feel that way, really let it sink in. That's the second major strategy I talked about. Really letting it land when through good fortune or effort you, you've earned 
uh, it's occurring, the opportunity to feel basically all right right now, already strong enough to meet the challenges of your life, already calm in your core, already sturdy enough, already basically okay, already, already at peace in your innermost being, already accessing perhaps an unconditional, invulnerable, unshakable peacefulness mysteriously present in the core of your being. When you have these opportunities, ah, lean into them and beware the tendency to, to, to experience them and then habitually, as the brain is designed to do, move into becoming distinct from being, move into expectations and, and a kind of leaving of the present into an imagined future. There's a place for that, for planning and so forth, but we tend to get very hijacked by those tendencies toward becoming, which the Buddha called out. And instead, as best you can, you know, many, many times a day, especially if you're prone to anxiety, especially if you have a trauma history, especially if you're dealing with conditions in your life that understandably stir up anxieties, understandably are painful, understandably are threatening. The more that your life is painful or threatening, the more important it is to, to in, engage these two strategies I've described aimed at the, the cha challenges to safety. And then more and more, what is life landing on? You know, is it landing on an underlying sense of fearfulness and irritability and helplessness? I call that the red zone, which is the fuel for craving and thus suffering. Or as life comes to you, does it land on an already underlying sense of your own calm strength, feeling sufficiently equipped for the challenges you face and an underlying sense of, of peacefulness and basic all rightness in the present already. That's the green zone. And we can develop um, that way of being already through these two strategies of cultivating particular strengths and internalizing experiences of feeling safe enough in the present. And this approach is completely within your power. It is not a spiritual bypass. It does not turn away from suffering and real pain and real threats. It's at the heart of effective coping. And it's how over time we truly can develop a resilient well-being that uh, is with us wherever we go in the face of increasing challenges. Okay. Well, I'm quite happy to have been able to uh, move through, you know, the kind of the, um, the nuggets there that I wanted to explore. And I'm now going to take, now I'm taking a look at the chat. I always read everything that's come in. Um, I can respond only to a fraction of what comes in. Uh, <clears throat> what daily practices, Linda asks at 23 minutes past the hour, can help balance planning and goals with resting and present awareness? Um, one thing that really helps is to get good at planning and doing so that when you uh, plan your work and then work your plan, you can have a sense of completion about it, that you know, okay, I have a basic plan and I'm, and I'm making reasonable efforts toward my plan. That really helps, <laughs> you know, <laughs> really helps uh, in very, very practical ways. And then to, as I talked about uh, some weeks ago, to know when it's enough that your plan is good enough for now and you're going to iterate, you're going to keep revising it and in an upward positive spiral as you go forward, but it's enough for now. Or to know that enough, you've done enough today, you can clock out and whatever, 
<laughs> your pleasure is like watching, uh, you know, reruns of key plays in the 49ers most recent football game, go Niners or whatever it might be to know when it's enough and to give yourself the blessing and the benediction. Hey, hey, Rick. Hey, Linda. Hey, whoever. <sighs> good job. You made a good plan. You did what you could. That's enough for today. And you're going to get up and, and, and make wise efforts tomorrow. Good for you. That's enough. So I, I find that really helpful. Uh, if there's a nagging sense, listen to it. It could be that it's just meaningless rumination. And you can turn to that voice in the back of your head and go, thank you for sharing. And I got it. Enough with you already. You know, I'm going to listen to other you know, voices in the, around the round table in the village of my own mind. Enough with you. On the other hand, maybe that voice is saying, you know, there's something you really need to think about and plan for and take care of and address. Action binds anxiety. Productive action that deals with real problems um, is a very important aspect of what I'm talking about here that is so far I'm focusing on the inner world, but we, it's important to take skillful action in the outer world as well. All right. um, I've been asked, how might one recognize spiritual bypassing taking over when employing these various strategies? Um, I think one recognizes this over time. You know, am I avoiding real issues? Uh, I personally observe that, uh, that in most cases, the concern that's being raised here doesn't actually occur. Because as people develop strengths that help them cope better, with real challenges to safety, they cope more with real challenges to safety because they have more, they're more resourced, they're more equipped. So they don't, they don't lollygag more than ever by becoming, you know, strong uh, in dealing with threats to safety. They actually engage their threats to safety. And others, you know, like our spouses or, or others who can go, you know, it, you know, you, you're really good at meditating, but you keep avoiding going to that doctor for your annual checkup and soothing your anxiety about, you know, there might be something wrong by meditating. And I don't think that's very good for you. So listening to other people can be really helpful too. Okay. Um, let's see, we're moving toward an end. Um, uh, Sarah asks about false alarms. Uh, labeling the false alarm, that's my third suggestion, whether it comes from emotional residues in our past or from bodily issues like illness or inflammation or from the deep, deep roots of a kind of primal catastrophe when we were really, really young, uh, simply identifying that that's the source of the inner sense of alarm, inner sense of apprehensiveness, fearfulness, uneasiness, uh, you know, even panic. So labeling it is the is crucial, and then uh, sometimes you can't stop it. You know, the body is inflamed; it still hurts, and it's sending signals up to your brain, alarm signals that make you feel anxious. Uh, Maybe there's a residue from your childhood trauma. Maybe there's the primal uh, catastrophe of, of birth in some cases or other things very early in childhood, in infancy. Um, it's just there, but the fact that you've reframed it, you've changed your perspective on it, the meaning of it, is huge. You've created a kind of buffer, kind of shock absorber between you and it. Now, over time, you know, you can do things to gradually release and, um, yeah, release emotional residues from childhood gradually, gradually over time. There are a lot of practices about that, a lot of therapies for that, a lot of useful tools. Gradually, you do what you can with health conditions of various kinds. Uh, you do what you can. Um, and with regard to that kind of primal, uh, panic way down deep, um, you know, I think what I call linking, where you gradually bring to bear um, matched positive experiences that address that deep, 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 quote unquote, negative material, 
uh, you can do that. And I talked about bringing a kind of soothing and lovingness and ease and reassurance to the absolutely youngest layers of your own psyche. Um, you know, that can help them gradually soften over time. And it's not an exact way to put it, but you can help those youngest layers realize, quote unquote, in some sense, ha, ah, that it's okay now. Yeah, that was terrifying and terrible then. And it's okay now. And have not just the adult parts of you realize it's okay now, but to actually help the, the most infantile, youngest, preverbal parts of yourself, layers of yourself, settle into reassurance.